rosso. Come si vede se fai? Thank you for taking the time to be here with us and for the interest in the topic of methodologies and the science for multi-source processes. With non-probability data, we are going to discuss here today. The session is organized in the following way. Each presenter has 15 minutes to illustrate their work. At the end, uh, Professor Ranalli will give uh, her discussion and uh, if there is uh, any time left, there will be uh, a small space dedicated to a floor discussion. The three talks that will be presented in this session illustrate three experiences. One, Italian-Dutch experience, which was born out of the collaboration between La Sapienza University in Rome, Vrij University in Amsterdam, and Istat. One French experience from INSEE, and one American experience from U.S. Bureau of the Census. The three papers share a number of common aspects. The first is integration. Official statistical production benefits greatly from the integrated use of different sources. The second aspect is statistical models which deal transparently and reproducibly with problems that the administrative data do not allow to be solved independently. The third aspect is the use of census or direct surveys to validate the quality of administrative records while defining the parameters of statistical model and derived probabilities used in constructing statistical registers. A relevant point, at least for me, coming from official statistics, is the many communalities across the four countries. In the integrated use of administrative and survey data in the construction of the statistical information incorporated in, the, in statistical registers. Let's turn now to the first presentation. Multi-source data, new approaches for non-standard employment statistics. The Dutch and the Italian experience. The work is presented by Roberta Barriale from La Sapienza University of Rome. Using data from the Employment Register and the Labor Force Survey, the research group estimate error corrected employment trajectories using multiple group high the Markov model in order to enable useful cross-country comparison. Roberta, the floor is yours. 
So first of all, let me thank the organization for this beautiful and interesting event. And uh, yeah, I'm going to, sorry, I put the timer. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to present a joint work uh, with uh, Silvia and Daniela from ISTAT, uh, Maurizio and Dimitro from uh, Frei Universiteit, uh, and Reinhold from uh, CBS, and me from uh, Sapienza. So we all know that in official statistics, one big problem, one challenge problem from a methodological point of view is to use uh, an integration of uh, different data sources. So here in ISTAT, we have a big uh, research project uh, among uh, ISTAT, CBS, and Freie Universität of Amsterdam uh, that is on the live course dynamics approach for non-standard employment. In this big project, uh, we are dealing with different sub-projects, all dealing with this big topic that is integration of different data sources. In this particular work, uh, I will present uh, the use uh, of uh, multiple, multiple group hidden Marco models to estimate uh, uh, error corrected employment trajectories uh, as uh, um, it was introduced. So we have two countries and we have two different data sources. One is the labor force survey and the other one is the employment register. Okay. Um, no, così. And uh, actually, which are the main, uh, the main characteristics of these data sources? Uh, from the point of view of the labor force survey, the main common characteristics between the different countries is that uh, this is the primary source of information on the labor statistics. And uh, of course, there is a regulation at the European level that they have to follow. Uh, it is a continuous survey carry out uh, during all the year. The interviews are referred uh, to all the weeks of, of each quarter. Uh, it is representative of the national population aged 15 and older, and it has a quarterly rotation scheme. The differences uh, are in the sampling design and in the power panel waves. Here we can see the panel waves. So actually what happens in Italy is that uh, a potential respondent is interviewed two, in two quarters, then is not interviewed for other two quarters, and then it is interviewed again for other two quarters. So we have two uh, observations, two missing and two observations, at least potentially. In uh, the Netherlands, instead, we have uh, five continuative waves. So a potential interview uh, is carried out for five time points, five quarters. Um, then, from the point of view of the employment register, we have uh, that uh, in Italy, uh, the employment register that is internally managed by ISTAT. It is built uh, by integrating administrative data that are collected by social security and tax authorities. It, is, uh, it follows a process of uh, pre-processing pre and harmonization in order to extract information about the worker coherent with the International Labor Office definition and it contains weekly and monthly information depending on the original data sources. In the Netherlands, the uh, Dutch Employment Register is administered uh, by the Institute for Employee Insurance. It contains information on the labor market uh, for all insured workers in the Netherlands, and it contains monthly information. But employers typically submit relevant data only once a year. So our data, we have two distinct, two distinct indicators, one coming from the labor force survey and the other one from the register uh, in Italy and in the Netherlands. Uh, these indicators are related to the employment contract. So we have three different levels. First level is uh, employees with permanent contracts. Then we have employees with fixed term contracts and then others. Uh, the analysis will be based uh, on quarterly data and focuses on individuals aged between 25 and 55. We had the problem because our data set was huge, so we had to run a, um, a, a random sample of about 10 percentage of units. We have also additional information, gender education level, whether the interview was conducted by proxy, etc. The Italian data run from 2017 to 2021. Um, and as I told you, the number of uh, labor force survey interviews uh, are maximum four. 
Instead, for the Dutch data, we have data from 2016 to 2019, and the number of labor force sub interview is maximum five. So here you see the content of our problem. Uh, you see the distribution of employment categories in the employment register and the labor force survey for Italy. As you see, uh, the, the overall misclassification rate is more or less uh, 11 percentage. So actually when, which is the rate when the two sources uh, do not agree in the information. And then we have here the marginal distribution from the uh, employment register and the marginal distribution from the labor force survey. And you see that in Italy, actually, more or less, the things are going quite well. So actually, the two sources provide, uh, let's say, consistent information. Of course, we have some problems. The main problem are for the temporary uh, category. So if you look at the temporary category in the labor force survey, then uh, uh, not every time actually it is uh, um, observed as a temporary in the employment register. And of course, also the contrary. In the Netherlands, the problems are a bit uh, higher because actually the total misclassification rate, rate is more or less 18 percentage, and also the marginal distribution are different. If you see that we have, of course, we have still problems on the temporary um, um, category. So, for example, if you look at uh, uh, the temporary category in uh, the labor force survey, actually uh, not every time is uh, uh, observed as a temporary um, category in the employment register. But we also have a bit lower uh, percentages also on the diagonals for the permanent contract. So, actually, there is a problem also for the permanent category that we didn't observe, observe in the Italian data. Then, here we have the observed transition flow in the labor force survey data and the employment register data by quarters. Um, you see that uh, the trend uh, that are, okay, of course, you cannot see uh, everything here, so I have to tell you something. Uh, so the blue line is for the uh, temporary to permanent. To other, sorry, temporary to other from the two sources, uh, and the green line is from temporary to permanent for the two sources. So the trend that they, the sources capture is quite similar. Okay, they do overlap uh, in some, uh, in many situations. Uh, actually, there is uh, something that. Uh, for the moment, we won't take into account that are the period uh, after 20, so after pandemic. Okay, that we won't take into account uh, in our analysis because uh, we know that it's too complicated to effort uh, in this uh, preliminary work. Here is uh, uh, the situation in the Netherlands and actually here we see a kind of different situation because the trend of the temporary to permanent category is similar from the two sources but is quite different in terms of level. What we are going to use is uh, uh, hidden Markov models to estimate the employment uh, categories uh, during time. Uh, the employment categories uh, um, have three categories, as I told you. So permanent contract uh, employees with fixed term and contract uh, and individuals with uh, other kind of contract. And what we are assuming is that uh, uh, there is a, a discrete latent variable with these three categories that, that represent the true employment uh, uh, status. And then there is an, a measurement process that is described by the distribution of the observed variables conditional on the latent variables. We have to say that in the recent literature there are many works conducted by Italian or uh, Dutch uh, uh, researchers uh, that uh, have more or, less, more or less the same characteristics uh, and they also arrive to the to similar conclusion. So we are confident about this methodology. Uh, here is a very simple representation of the hidden Markov model. Here you have the latent status that is the X variable that is the true contract type. So you have a um, process that is running uh, from uh, the zero time point to the 11 time point because sorry, we selected only three years where the sources uh, overlap completely from the two countries. Uh, and you have a measurement process that is uh, represented by these arrows. 
uh, that uh, basically uh, show you how the process is observed uh, in our, uh, uh, here is the employment register, so we don't have missing data, and here is our labor force survey, so we have also missing structure. This is the basic, very basic um, hidden Marco model. Then uh, we extended uh, this model in order to take into account uh, more uh, realistic uh, assumptions. And actually what we did, uh, I go directly to the graph, uh, sorry, but actually we are still assuming uh, the same latent process. Okay, but this time we say that uh, this latent process also depends uh, on uh, some covariates uh, that in our case are age and proxy interview. And then also this latent process uh, depends also on timing. Okay, so we have this transition that uh, uh, follow these uh, different patterns during time. And uh, this uh, process is characterized by an initial state, probability of uh, initial state, and then probability of transitions in uh, different categories. And then here we have the same uh, measurement process, but this time what we assume is that the measurement process uh, in time t may depend uh, on what happened uh, in t minus one, both in the latent state, uh, but also in, a, in the observed state. So actually we are losing the um, um, independence uh, assumption of uh, a different time point, of the measurement process uh, in different time point. Uh, we don't go into details, so I would just want to show you that basically this model uh, is just uh, a, um, uh, you see, uh, just a multiplication of probabilities that are modeled uh, through multinodal logic models. Here we have a part uh, that is uh, representing the latent process, so the initial state probability and then the transition probability in the X variable that represents our latent state. And then here we have the measurement process, so actually the probability of observing something in a category in the uh, employment register that is depending on uh, the, um, the time point, uh, the latent status at time point T, but also from uh, the past. And the same happens also from the labor force survey. So actually we have a division of the structure, structure part and the measurement process. Now, we want to compare, we said that we want to compare these two countries. How? We use the multiple group uh, uh, hidden Marco model where basically we are trying to compare if the two models, uh, hidden Marco models, uh, um, are in some way similar in the two countries and how they are similar. So we have two extremes. In one extreme, we have uh, that uh, uh, we have all equal model parameters across groups that are countries. So actually we assume that uh, they are exactly the same. In the other extreme, everything is different, okay? Of course, in the middle, we have many different models that can be tested. Um, we use quarterly data from 2017 to 2019. Uh, for the estimates, we use the maximum likely estimation using the expectation maximization algorithm. As a software, we used Light and Gold version 6. Um, the final model selection occurred in two steps. Actually, the model selection may be can be considered one part that is the most difficult part because actually there are many different uh, um, ideas but also perspective that come out. So actually uh, we try to be as, uh, uh, as linear as possible but it, was a, it is a very difficult uh, um, challenge. So first of all we choose the model based on parameter invariance across the two countries and then we specify the different measurement error component. So let's see. Uh, in the first step, we had five models. In the baseline, basically we are assuming the invariance of the parameters of both the structural part, so the latent state part, but also in the measurement error part. This is the baseline. Then in the second part, we have four models where we assume heterogeneity in the structural part with different specification of the measurement part. Okay, don't go in details because we don't have time. 
And uh, actually, we choose the, the model uh, with the heterogeneity in the structural part because we cannot assume that the two countries have the same patterns in terms of uh, real uh, contract type process, but also invariance in the measurement error of both indicators. Um, and then in the second step, uh, we estimated many different models. Uh, I just arrived to the end, where basically you see the model here, E, where basically we have uh, the same type of configuration of the measurement part uh, in the two countries, but with different in intensity. So we are assuming that we have the same parameters, uh, but uh, that these parameters can, be, uh, can have a different strength in the two countries. And uh, here basically are the main results, just one minute. Uh, basically we are in this model, uh, I didn't go into details uh, because of timing, but basically in this model we are assuming that we have different structural part, okay? And then in the measurement process, uh, we are assuming that uh, the error that you can make a time team depends on the fact that you made the same error in time team minus one. So actually, here are the conditional estimated probabilities for error repetitions. And if you compare Italy and the Netherlands, what you see that uh, uh, you, the error that you can do in Italy, the probability of the error is, uh, of the repetition of the error is uh, always lower than uh, the probability of repetition in the Netherlands. So it seems that uh, this uh, strength uh, in repeat, the, the error uh, is, is stronger in uh, the Netherlands uh, than uh, in uh, Italy, both for the labor force survey, but especially for uh, the uh, comparison between uh, uh, basically these uh, cells, so for the employment register data. And actually this can come also from the, the way how the Netherlands collects data in the employment register. And these are the observer transition flow from temporary to permanent contract, both in labor for survey and employment register data, and the one estimated uh, by quarters in Italy and Netherlands from the model. So uh, the, the straight line, okay, is the one that is uh, um, um, estimated through the model. Of course, it is smooth because it's a, a quadratic uh, uh, model uh, of the probability of transition rate. And instead here, you see that uh, uh, in the blue, um, you have the Netherlands. You see the, the, the same behavior as we had before, of course, of the transition probabilities. And uh, in Italy, you see that the overlap was much uh, higher compared to the Netherlands. And so, conclusion, uh, basically, we know from literature that measurement error threatens mobility estimates, and this is also what we found here. Uh, there are some differences between uh, Italy and the Netherlands, but these differences uh, are not that large. As a next step, for, of course, we have to further discuss on model selection. That is a big topic. Uh, we need to split the other category to self-employed and not employed. We should consider a longer time period and also uh, would be very useful to discuss with subject matter expert. And then I want to say that this is a, a preliminary job. So actually it's a kind of work in progress. So we are still discussing a lot between countries, between researchers in Italy. So uh, any comments, questions, suggestions are more than welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Roberta. We now move uh, on the second presentation. The second talk is uh, setting up a statistical registers of individuals and dwellings updated with administrative sources, up approach and first steps. The talk is given by Aurelien Lavergne a sen uh, project manager at uh, uh, INSEE. It describes the experience of INSEE in carrying out a program to create a system of interconnected registers of individuals, dwellings and households. 
Moreover, the dual estimation methodology is applied to measure the quality of coverage of the registers using annual population census data and to assess the parameters of the models used in the register construction. Aureliana, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. So, hello, my name is uh, Aurélien Laverne and I work at the French National Institute of Statistics. So, today I'm going to present the program I am working on, uh, the construction of a statistical register of individuals and dwellings updated with administrative sources. So, to start with, I will explain why we have decided to build a French statistical register system now in France. Then I will delve into the technical challenges and methodological issues we are facing. Uh, in the third part, I will focus on the constitution of a reference universe based on the science of life method. And finally, I will explain how we plan to assess the quality of this reference universe by evaluating the coverage measure. So let's discuss the context, the context. Why is it the right time uh, in, for us in France to build a statistical register system of individuals and dwellings? Currently, uh, there is no statistical population register in France. The only individual register available is an administrative one that records the births, deaths, and arrivals from abroad. The administrative register contains an ID for each individual, but this ID is not shared with other administrative sources due to restrictions on sharing. Indeed, a project of a shared ID was abandoned in the 19th after a significant controversy. Nowadays, uh, Eurostat promotes the use of administrative data and encourages data linkage. And moreover, in France, a decree was issued to authorize the use of a non-significant statistical ID to facilitate file matching within the national statistical system. So in this context, the RESIL program was launched to create a system of interconnected statistical registers for individuals and dwellings. This uh, register will be deployed in 2025 to modernize the statistical and social information system of the Institute. It will enable the production of sampling frames and provide inputs for census processes. It also will facilitate record linkages and quality assessments. Additionally, it will harmonize tools for exploiting administrative data. So, when a RESIL goes into production, it consists of two registers continuously updated with administrative data on birth and death. So one register for individuals and one register for dwellings. There will be three reference universities, one for individuals, one for dwellings, one for households. These universities will be updated annually and will only contain individual, individuals residing in France thanks to the use of the science of life method. Each individual will be assigned their usual residence and each dwelling will be categorized as main, secondary, or vacant. From these two reference universities, individuals and dwellings, a list of households and their composition will be deduced. Resil will also offer two services, the reception and the integration of administrative data, and the, produ the production of enriched files by matching them with other social data. So, for example, it will be, it will be possible for us, if the statistical purpose justifies it, to supplement survey data with information from an administrative data source. So, I will now introduce you to the global process of the RESIL register and the technical challenges and methodolog methodological issues we must overcome. So as input to the individual register, we have the administrative individuals register and other administrative sources, including, including the employment file, student file, social files, and tax files. For the dwellings register, we also have tax files, which is the only source that links dwellings and individuals. 
And we also have the non-conventional households register that includes uh, senior residences, student residences, prisons, hotels, and so on. So let's discuss the global process. Each dwelling and each individual in each source are identified with a non-significant statistical ID. Then for individuals, we retain only French residents and assign them their usual residence. So we can categorize each dwelling as main, secondary or vacant. And finally, we obtain two reference universes with a list of individuals located in their main residence and a list of dwellings. To assess the quality of each reference universe, we annually measure the degree of coverage of the registers. And this is done by comparing population estimate using the annual census survey. And for each step, for each step, we have several methodological challenges to overcome. First matching, then the science of life method, then priority priority prioritization rules and finally the dual system the dual system estimation method to assess the quality so for each one for these tools we face methodological challenges to identify individuals we aim to have the best record linkage to measure the french population resident we need to tune the science of life model to assign a usual resident to each individual prioritization rules will be implemented among each data source in case of multiple address, addresses. To measure the coverage of our reference populations, our objective is to implement the dual system, uh, the dual estimation method to identify the coverage defects in the register. And we are also conducting specific work on overseas individuals because we know that in these territories, the coverage of administrative sources may be less optimal. So I will now focus on the constitution of the reference universe for individuals and explain how the science of life method is implemented in the RESIL process. So to account for birth, death, and individuals arriving in France from abroad and who need social security, we rely on the, on the administrative register of individuals. However, this register does not provide information on individuals leaving the French territory. Therefore, we will attempt to estimate the probability of residence in French territory for each individual by analyzing their presence in the various administrative sources at our disposal. And finally, by applying a threshold to this probability, we can deduce the reference population. So this is the first application of the science of life method. For now in Brazil, the only source for which we have determined if an individual re resides or not on the French territory is the tax source. That's why here we have a segmentation of the population into two groups based on the tax source. Individuals residing in France according to the tax source and those presumed non-resident based on several variables directly present in the tax source. And next, we can use other sources to confirm these results. For now, the only decision rule implemented concerns the quality of the, of the identif identification of an individual. An individual is retained in the final population only if their identification quality is good, at least in one source. So for now, we cannot yet use the, the administrative individuals to reg, uh, register to count death. Therefore, we use the death variable directly present in the tax files. And this first implementation on, of the science of life method counts between 54 and 59 million adult residents on the French territory, compared to 53 million adult residents census recorded in 2020. For the 5.3 million individuals with uncertain residence status, we need to explore further and establish new decision criteria based on other administrative sources available to us, excluding tax files. 
So when we have this reference universe, we have to assess the quality of the population measured by Resil, and we must measure the coverage rate to, Res to Resil compared to another system. In the case of France, the existence of an annual census is a very important asset for, measure, for measuring the quality of Brazil. It will enable measuring the degree of coverage of the register and the degree of uh, coverage of the census every year. And the census has several adv advantages. It is a large-scale survey that counts 5 million dwelling each year. However, it also presents several difficulties. It is not exhaustive in large municipalities. Only one-fifth of small municipalities are surveyed, surveyed each year. Um, the identification quality in the census is not very good for some of them because the survey is paper-based and identity of individuals are not of good quality. So in this bar chart, each bar represents the entire census population. The orange bar indicates the proportions of individuals identified in, the, identified in the tax records relative to the total census population. The green bar represents the proportion of individuals identified exclusively through other sources, excluding tax files. While in blue, it shows the percentage of individuals identified only in the census. So as you can see, using multiple administrative sources improves coverage, especially for young adults. However, some populations will, con will continue to be only captured by the census. So using uh, multiple sources improves coverage, but also introduces a risk, a risk of over coverage. Indeed, on this graph, you can see in blue the population of Brazil segmented by age group, where all individuals present in, in administrative sources are retained. In red, it is the Brazil population after applying the science of life method. And in yellow, it is the population measured by the census. So the first decision rules on the science of life, of life model give encourages, uh, encourages results. The, because um, the, this modeling reduces over coverage for all age groups. However, it is not yet suffi sufficient to reach the levels of the census population, and there is still over coverage in the Brazil database. So, for us, the, the upcoming work will involve fine tuning the science of life model to minimize over coverage in Brazil. Indeed, to apply the dual, the dual estimation method, there should no longer be over coverage in Brazil. So to achieve this, first, with uh, the administrative individuals register, we will have a better measurement of this. And then we will also use this formula used in Estonia to apply the method to define the ponderation of each source regarding its quality and its field the covered field for each source, and, and so on. So finally, when, when there is no more over coverage in Brazil, the dual, system, the dual system estimation method can be applied. For us, the objective of this method is not to provide an estimation of the population size, but to have quality indicators for registers. These indicators will be used to measure the discrepancies between the census and Brazil, they will also allow us to identify subpopulations that are under or over represented in both Brazil and the census. And these indicators will, will also provide a measure of the coverage rate and will be made available to users. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Aurelien. The, the presentation is um, on, um, on the web. It's a remote presentation. I don't know. And uh, yes. <laughs> uh, the third presentation is uh, uh, on the topic of producing US population statistics 
using multiple administrative sources. The talk is given by David Brown in the, uh, from US Census Bureau, illustrates the challenges encountered when creating population projection from, for 2020. The paper deals with problem of location correctness, the consistency of person coverage over time, and forecasting demographic traits. Regression analysis show how the, uh, the issues and their solutions impact county population estimates based on that regis uh, register. David, David, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the, to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present. Um, this is joint work with Marta Murray Close, who is also from the US Census Bureau. And our disclaimer, um, this, this is, these are our views and not those of the Census Bureau and all of the results have been reviewed to make sure that no confidential information has been disclosed. So we did an experiment in 2020 um, to produce population estimates using uh, administrative data rather than uh, survey collected data. And then we compared them to the, the 2020 census. And in this presentation, I'm gonna talk about some of the challenges that we've encountered in, in trying to design a methodology to do this. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the challenges include, um, how do we cover all eligible people uh, and exclude people who are, are not eligible? So um, including residents who are alive on, on the reference date and excluding people who are non-residents or, or not alive. Also, um, how do we ensure that there's consistency of coverage across time? It's one thing to have an estimate for one time period, um, but how do you uh, do a good job of, of estimating uh, growth in the population over time when you're using all these different sources that may come in and out um, and they may not be consistent over time? Also, how do we make sure that we person in their correct residence on the reference date? We don't always have information exactly on the reference date, um, which is also true of, an, of, of a census, um, at least the way that we do it. Um, so, so that's another challenge. And then finally, um, consistency of the demographic characteristics. Um, there, there are changes in the questionnaires um, that the, the Census Bureau uses for uh, race and ethnicity, for example, um, and so that can, lead to some inconsistencies between the administrative data, which are using past um, reports that people might have made several years ago using a different questionnaire um, to a current report from um, today's census or survey. Next slide, please. So uh, he here I'm showing um, the, the, the share of the population or the, of the administrative record population that's coming from each of the sources. We, we use 31 sources and I'm, I'm only showing a few of them here. Um, tax data, the Internal Revenue Service data, cover most people, 88.5% of the people, uh, but they don't cover everybody. So not everybody has to file taxes, um, particularly uh, lower income people. And so if you just relied on tax data, you would have a, you would have a, a significant hole. Um, and so that's why we have to turn to other sources as well. And um, driver's licenses is, is, is a good source because most adults have a driver's license, um, but we were only able to get those for five states. Um, the states where we were able to get them, it added 3% to the population. Um, compared to all, all the 30 other sources. So uh, we know that uh, we're missing some people because we only have the source for five states. Um, the other 
biggest big source is coming from a commercial data source or third party data source that uses things like magazine subscriptions and utility records, et cetera. Um, and then there's a large number of other smaller sources um, that will cover different segments of the population, like retirees, uh, the Medicare data um, are for people all over the age 65, uh, welfare program data for, for catching some of the lower income people that we might not have gotten in the tax data, et cetera. Um, next slide, please. So one of the biggest challenges with coverage is children, um, because most administrative sources don't cover children. Um, the, the main source for, for children is individual income tax forms uh, where they are listed as dependents. Um, however, as I mentioned in the last slide, not everybody files taxes and uh, infants. So um, children um, don't appear in the year that they're born um, because um, they won't be able to be listed as a dependent until the following year. And so there's a lag in, in when we see the, those children. Uh, so some alternatives that we've been looking at, um, one is that all, all US born children have a social security number, uh, which is uh, given to them at birth and uh, generally in the hospital where they're born. Um, and so that's another way to, to add children if we don't see them anywhere else. Um, a drawback of that is that the, the Social Security Administration data, they, they record the, the child's birth city, uh, but not where they're currently living on, on the reference. There's some issue with putting them in the right place. Um, another thing that we do is we link children to their parents. So if the parent is in administrative records and, and we have an address for the parent, we can just assign the parent's address to the child. Now, the drawback of that is that not all children live with their biological parents. And so uh, you, you may have some errors there. Uh, next slide, please. So we're gonna um, show the effects of um, these two um, like second best um, strategies to um, uh, to improve our population or estimates for children uh, by using a, a benchmark from demographic analysis, which is a cohort component um, method using vital statistics, um, birth and death records. Um, and so the, the demographic analysis has three sets of estimates, high, middle, and low, depending on, on their assumptions. Uh, it's considered to be the most reliable estimates that we have for children. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, when we're adding um, people from the what's called the Numident, or um, it's, it's the uh, database with all the, all the social security numbers, all, um, that I was mentioning, if, if we don't see a person in any other source uh, and they're under the age of two, we, we added them uh, at their um, place of birth. When, when we um, add them, it go, the, the deficit that we have between the administrative data uh, and the demographic analysis changes from minus 14.7% to uh, about minus 1%. So we uh, reduce the, uh, the deficit that we had in, in children uh, under the eight of, um, between the age of, of zero and two um, dramatically. Um, so there's, there's we, we at least are covering nearly all of the young children uh, now when we um, add them, um, you know, due, due to this social security number database, but their their low not always be um, accurate. And then, as far as the parent child linkage uh, method goes, um, and we were doing that for for children, um, you know, all, all children, not just young children. Um, 
the deficit with the demographic analysis goes from minus 5% to basically zero. Um, and so that seems to be quite effective at at least counting uh, the children, um, maybe or maybe not at, in the right places. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, record linkage is another uh, challenge. Um, we, we only including people that we can assign a unique identifier um, because we wanna make sure that we're only counting each person once and that we want to be able to merge in characteristics about their, their demographics and their location. Uh, we found that if you uh, have a social security number in the administrative record source, that's gonna give you the most reliable record linkage but however, some, some sources don't have social security numbers. And so we turn to address as the next best. Um, but we're finding that uh, the type of address makes a difference. Um, some people um, don't have a street address, so they might have a post office box or a rural route in, instead of a street address. And those are more ambiguous. Um, next slide, please. So in our in our commercial data source that we had, um, we had a, a number of people that we couldn't assign um, this unique identifier, and so we weren't able to include them in our population estimates. And we found that if if you had a social security number in in the commercial data, um, most of the time you were able we were able to assign them a unique identifier, um, regardless of what type of address they had. Um, but if we had to rely on the address for the record linkage, um, we were able to assign a unique identifier much more often if they had a street address than if they had a post office box or a rural route. And this matters because um, post office boxes and, and rural routes are much more common in rural areas. And so we, we were finding that, that our um, population estimates from the administrative data tended to be lower in rural areas um, compared to the actual census. Um, and we think that, that this record linkage issue is... Uh, next slide, please. So excluding ineligible people. Um, so we uh, exclude people if they're not alive on the reference date. Now, one problem is that we don't always have death information about every person. Um, and so a second thing is, um, is a signs of life approach like the pre previous presentation was talking about. So they have a U.S. address and their vintage is near the reference date. Uh, now, one of the drawbacks of, of a signs of life approach is that there are some people who um, come in and out of administrative data and they may not have appeared in administrative data recently but they are actually in the country and, and it would be nice to be able to include them. So we'll, we're um, seeing if we can develop some kind of model to predict um, the, the people who are in uh, administrative data infrequently, their probability of, of being in the country and, and alive on the reference date. Uh, next slide, please. So coverage consistency. Um, you wanna have access to the same sources over time, but we don't always. Um, we don't always receive sources on time um, to produce our estimates. And, and any individual source can change over time in, in, how, in the, the people that it covers. Uh, we've found that people who are in only one administrative source, um, they are more likely to come in and out of administrative data, and that's going to lead to less consistency in our estimates. Uh, next slide, please. And so there are some differences across demographics in terms of, of uh, this consistency issue. So uh, we, we actually lost some of the 31 sources um, because we don't have uh, current uh, data sharing agreements with some of these uh, sources. Um, and so I, I did an analysis of what, what is the impact on coverage by uh, demographics um, when you lose some of these sources. And, and the sources were mostly covering non-citizens. Um, 
found that um, especially children um, uh, age zero to two and age 18 to 24 had the biggest um, losses of, whereas um, retirees, uh, there was a very little loss of coverage. Next slide, please. And there was uh, more loss of coverage for Hispanics and non-Hispanic Asians than there was for blacks and whites. Um, and that shouldn't be surprising because um, in the US, um, Hispanics and non-Hispanic Asians um, are, they are um, a higher share of the non-citizen population. Uh, next slide, please. We had a couple sources that arrived too late to be able to use in our real-time analysis, our real-time um, population projections. Um, one was uh, some tax returns um, that were processed late. And the other was uh, Medicaid, which is uh, health insurance for uh, low-income people. Um, and we found that um, the, the impact on coverage was um, bigger for children than adults. Next slide, please. Um, and the, the coverage um, um, degradation was also um, bigger for minority groups than for whites. Um, so the, the, the not having those sources in a timely fashion uh, was affecting minority groups and, and children. I think I've run out of time, so I, I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you, David. You were perfect in time. <laughs> and uh, now the floor is to uh, the discussion of Professor Ranalli. Yes, good morning. Um, thank you. I think the slides will be up soon, hopefully. Yes. So um, I need a remote. Can you ask Aurelian? Remote? OK. So thank you. Uh, the, the session was very diverse, in a sense. We had two clusters. The first cluster is made by the first presentation, and then the other two presentations were more similar, in a sense. So the first one was very specific, and uh, so my comments would be, in a sense, easier, because when you get specific uh, contents, it's easier to make comments, while the other two were very wide in their content. So for me, it was more complicated to try to find some uh, specific comments. So uh, going to the first um, presentation, so this paper, uh, goes in the stream of literature on the use of hidden Markov models to integrate the labor force survey and admin data for uh, unemployment. Uh, so for those of you who are not uh, familiar with ISTAT research, uh, this is something that's been going on in, in uh, ISTAT for a while, and it's a stream of research that I really appreciate, I have to say. And so the idea of integrating and using I mean, uh, address measurement error from two sources using it and Markov models, something that I really appreciate. So the steps forward in this paper just go towards three extensions from what I got. So the first one is the focus on mobility trends over time. So they're focusing on transition from uh, flexible to permanent employment, for example. And then the other main um, uh, change from the past is to try and look at cross-country comparison. Uh, to address cross-country comparison, then uh, they use uh, multiple group hidden Markov models. So the idea of extending um, hidden Markov models to account for different, different possibly uh, structural measurement errors. And I think that, I mean, um, this is really interesting, but um, the cross-country comparison, particularly uh, in my opinion, uh, that goes in the direction of our harmonization in a sense. So it would be a useful tool to address harmonization among countries. So overall comments. Um, I have to say that the paper, the paper is well written, but it's been hard to decrypt for me in a sense that he used a lot of what I would say latent gold jargon. So understanding what was behind each model has been complicated. So I thank uh, Roberta because we had the... Uh, <laughs> 
uh, a conversation that helped me a lot. And so a suggestion that I would uh, give to the authors for the final version of the paper would be to uh, just discuss the parameterization and the specification of the models with respect to formulas, for example, that would make understand the difference among the, the different models that they've tried uh, for everyone, even someone who doesn't use latent code. And, and also the pictures, for example, the pictures that you show today on the structure of the model would also be use, useful in the paper. And so at the beginning, when I first read the paper, I got also lost. And, but which is the main uh, uh, aim of the inference here? So because at first I thought it was, as usual here, mostly descriptive in the sense of uh, we want to estimate rates, unemployment rates, or the rate of the transition from temporary to permanent. But then, as you also saw in the presentation, there's also a flavor of analytic inference because they want to understand the differences among the, the two, between the two countries, so understanding the difference between. But when you have such different uh, inferences, then usually not always the same model works for both. So I think that you need to clarify better. If you want to understand the differences between the two countries, then you get one stream of modeling and model selection and understanding. But if you want to go towards descriptive, and so that's usually a prediction problem, then I would go towards a different path. And so just try to keep the, the two separate and it would be more. Because usually if it's a prediction problem and then you have a lot of data, you had so many data that you had to take a sample out of it, then I'm not 100% sure that information criteria that's been used AIC and BIC in the, in the paper may not be the, most, the only or the most useful model selection tools. They depend on the sample size and you're using a sample. And usually they're used for analytic inference, but if you have a lot of data and your perspective is prediction, then maybe you may want uh, to use other, um, other uh, uh, model selection. For example, cross-validation. I mean, you had a sample of the data, maybe you can understand how your model goes on the non-sample part of the sample. Uh, or since you're looking at uh, rates, how do the estimates of the true size of temporary, permanent, and other employment change according to the different models? Because that's what we're really interested in. Do they change a lot uh, for different specification of the model? And do they change a lot for subpopulation of particular interests? And what about the other transitions? So to and from temporary or to and from other? And which is the error of the final rates estimate? because you get an estimate of something which is not observed. So you, you may have a sort of a Horvitz-Thompson estimate, but the response is not directly observed, so you have an extra component there. It's not discussed in the paper. So specific comments and clarifications, this is just like a, uh, for the final version of the paper, it, it was not mentioned the dimension of the estimation problem, so I, how big the data set was and how big the sample size. In the end, are you computing weighted estimates or simple estimates? And just if you could cl clarify in the specification of the different models you have used, which is the difference between same error and an error. And then there was just like a, a typo in the paper, but I won't go into the details there. And then some uh, comments uh, that you may want to uh, look in the, in the future. So you may want, and you said that at the end, just to uh, further specify the other category. So divide that uh, more, I mean, self-employed and, and, and the other, uh, because that would change. Uh, I mean, you get better estimates of the transition probability. Uh, I would stress the fact that you really want the latent state to meet the same in the two countries, and this is because of harmonization. This is something, a plus that I really like into the paper. And at some point, you may want to put covariates in the structural part of the model. And so what really influences the structure, so the latent structure, and this would also be useful to include a structural breaks uh, such as COVID at some point that would allow you to use the whole data set that you have. You don't have to stop before COVID because we know that COVID was something big, but at some point we will have to deal with that. And so the model for the transition probabilities, you use just T and T squared, it may, be not, it may not be enough. 
because it's, uh, you may have a seasonal component, at least in some of the, uh, of the trends, uh, a seasonal component was there. And then you may also want to add covariates in the measurement of the, uh, of the, um, of the model. You just uh, mentioned age and proxy, but maybe education, the survey mod, for example, the metadata that you have in the labor force survey, that all affects the measurement error, and they can, have, they can be different in the two countries. Uh, or the time of completion in, in admin data, that's different between the two, the two countries. But thank you, very interesting. And then the other two, uh, the other two um, uh, papers on the administ administrative registers, uh, I will discuss them separately, but I, I have to say that most of the comments can be applied uh, to both. Uh, the, so the first paper describes a deep change in the production of official statistics in France. And so they're trying to build statistical registers of individuals, dwellings, and household. And the reference universe uh, is based on the use of a large number of sources. So the authors say in the paper, this is just more resilient than tax data only because you use a lot of uh, sources. And this word resilient is similar to another word that is used in the other paper from the US Census Bureau, use, I mean, facing the same, uh, the same, using the same approach. And so we're going towards a paradigm shift that um, in the end, the process will enable France to uh, gradually replacing survey data with admin data. And I have to say that the paper is, is very clear and it goes, uh, provides a very thorough picture of the whole process. And it was nice because it was just like seeing the plot of the movie that we have seen here in Italy in, in the past six years because this process has been going on here in Italy. And so, I mean, being in the advisory board for years, we've seen uh, many of the challenges that you are facing. I really appreciate the, the approach uh, of using other countries' experience, methods, and software. And one suggestion would be to uh, plan as you are doing uh, uh, the transition carefully. And so this will allow uh, for time to test, evaluate, and validate the, all the new estimation strategies. Um, time is precious. So one suggestion would be that I would say that as long as France can afford the large rolling census, it's being conducted now, so it's uh, five million dwellings, it's much larger than the one that is carried out in Italy. So as long as you can afford that, just keep doing it. And this is particularly for validation. And because uh, in both papers, we could see that there are a lot of choices that are made. And all these choices, in a sense, you need validation. So, for example, as you said, the evaluation of over and under coverage of the register. And this is very close to what uh, Professor Wu showed us in the morning. So, I mean, this, uh, um, uh, the, the census is really your reference sample that you can use to validate everything else that you have in the registers. And it's also something that you can use uh, uh, in all the choices that you have to make in the residency index that you mentioned and uh, in, uh, just to test all the possible model-based smaller estimation methods that you will end up using for all those variables that are uh, not in, uh, in the register, but that you, you will uh, survey in the census and you will uh, uh, need uh, estimates for. And as, and as far as the linkage service is, is uh, concerned, I would just, um, I don't know if it's a useful comment, but that's what I thought is, it would be useful to keep track and provide as much information as possible to secondary users, so, such as, for example, probability of a correct match for subgroups, because so that everyone who will be using uh, match data can actually know the level of error for, in general, the probability of correct linkage, but also for subgroups. And also because uh, secondary users can be within INSEE at some point, not only outside. And then just a, a quick word on the, on the residency index. Uh, I said in this index, so the, um, the um, residency of unit I at time T depends on the past and then depends, so it's a convex combination of the past and on the a sort of a weighted average of, uh, of signs of life. And so there are many choices to be, uh, to be made, like the choice of 
alpha and beta, the choice of the weight, which is related to the quality, and the choice of a threshold. So this is a score. At some point, you will have to decide after a certain threshold that unit is a resident or is not. And I would say that, as you mentioned, since coverage can be very different across subpopulations or domains, so maybe you will have, you may need different weights for different domains. And this is the only hint I try to give. Uh, it's more methodological, but there was an idea that residency can, can be seen as a latent variable. It's very much linked to what we saw in the previous paper, but so residency can be seen as a latent variable and it's hidden behind a set of signs of life. So you can have one, you can have two, you can have many. And you can think of, con I mean, at least trying to build a continuous latent construct, for example, using IRT model, item response theory models, uh, model based, and you can use this type of models to, uh, to get uh, like a, a score in the end, but also to get an idea of how to select the weights, AK. Or instead of using a, a continuous latent construct, you can use a categorical variable, such as, for example, this would uh, latent class or just a generalization for uh, uh, repeated measurements that's hidden Markov models. And this would also pr maybe provide uh, uh, cluster profiles. And then quickly, the, the, last, uh, the last paper. So uh, the usual, the idea of using multiple administrative register-based population statistics uh, in, in the paper is used the principle of redundancy. So resiliency in, in France and redundancy in the US. So using 31 sources. And so in a sense, so we're looking at population. This is just a simple depiction. So you're losing a lot of sources. So over coveraging but trying to, to encompass all, all, the, uh, all the population. But then there are challenges that were described in the presentation, such as locational accuracy, uh, personal um, coverage completeness and its consistency over time, children. Um, and there's one uh, in particular, the last one, the choice of demographic characteristics when multiple ones are reported or when they are missing altogether. And I think it was not, uh, discussed a lot in the presentation, but it was in the paper. And I would, as a comment, I would really say that uh, the issue of race and ethnicity discrepancy between uh, the register and the census, I think that can be handled using hidden Markov models very similarly uh, to the approach that was described in the, in the first paper. Uh, but then coverage varies by county in the US, so you have misplacement. So even if you use a lot of signals, there are um, counties or subpopulations for which uh, even the extended register is not enough. And so to improve on locational accuracy, and this is my last comment, um, for example, the w one idea was to include all the addresses for each unit. And so um, one possibility that has been explored in the US was that of using the American Community Survey to estimate the probability that a given address is the person's address on the reference date. And what I really appreciate from that experience is that a fraction of a person may be included in multiple locations. So you don't really have to be just in one county and not in the others. In Italy it would be you don't have to be at one a municipality and none in the others or one residence. And I think this would go to a FATSI assignment instead of a zero one assignment that it, it makes a lot of sense to me. And finally, as a closing remark, that we say we've seen a lot today about audit survey, the role of surveys as auditing. So to validate the many choices that are required. Um, on, on this um, perspective in Italy, uh, an area sample survey is used for quality assessment, particularly of hard to reach profiles and addresses. And recently at one of the advisory board, we've also discussed the possibility of using graph sampling or indirect sampling uh, to sample pairs of individuals and addresses uh, from the um, enhanced uh, register and to assess which is the prevalent address. And so there are uh, common research that is going on among countries that could useful be exchanged. Thank you.
The time is little, but uh, we have uh, two. Uh, we can collect two or three questions uh, if there is one. Natalie. So just a quick question, um, because you have panel data, so people are represented multiple times. How did you handle the clustering in the uh, hidden Markov uh, models? The clusters. You have, you have individuals that are uh, sampled over time. There is a, a, another, some other question. David. Uh, thank you. Uh, just a question for the first speaker. Um, I think you, you mentioned the paper that uh, the LFS data in Italy is like a inclusion probability proportional to size sampling with proportion, uh, proportional to the size of the municipality. And so, and then uh, as uh, uh, Giovanna mentioned, uh, uh, you know, for, for an analyticus, analytical uh, 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 purposes, yeah, you, you mentioned estimation and model selection. So AIC, BIC criteria. So have you taken the sampling design into account? So have you taken the potential informativeness of the sampling design? If, it is re if the size of the municipality, which I don't know, right? Is, is it related to the latent uh, variable that you have in your model? And, and so there is some literature on AIC, BIC for that accounts for the sampling design. So I was wondering if you had done that. Thank you. To the last two speakers, um, have, you, um, have you reasoned or in some, in some way uh, tried to have estimation also of commuting, I mean, population movements from one area to the other? because the concept of residency uh, that is uh, defined in, a, in, I would say, not, not very deterministic way uh, is related to the possibility of uh, counting people moving from one place to, to another. There is um, some question from the web. Thanks. <clears throat> a question for the second speaker. At a certain point, you said that you are not using your method for estimating the population size. So I would presume that you have a, a better method to do that. If so, which one? Or if not, why are not using that approach for estimating the population size? I, I don't know if there is an, no, no, uh, no question from the web. I have a question for the last two speakers. Uh, the first is if they inform a user on the accuracy of register estimates, or, or if, if you inform, or you want to inform the users, at, uh, if you inform the user at some domain level for subgroups and uh, for and uh, if you maintain both the uh, this is specific for your presentation if you maintain the probability you build in the register because in the process you compute some probability at individual level if you this cancel these probabilities or maintain them in the register. Give the floor to the presenter for very short answer. Okay, so I will try to be comprehensive. Um, first of all, thanks for all the comments that uh, Giovanna gave to us, and actually especially on uh, the model uh, 
selection program. That, uh, yeah, you're true that uh, we have to try to split the analytic and uh, descriptive inference and maybe to connect more appropriate uh, tools uh, for uh, the best model selection process. So, uh, to reply, um, uh, no, uh, the models do not provide, even if uh, we, ch we try different models, actually the size uh, of the um, latent status, uh, so the, the, the final, let's say, estimate of permanent, uh, temporary and other contract type, they do not change that much. So actually we concentrated uh, to the conditional probability that I showed you, if they have, they are some way consistent with reality and if they can be explainable in some way. But it's something that we should uh, stress on. And uh, also, actually, we have some difficulties in working together because actually for confidentiality reasons, everything is in a protected environment. So actually it's complicated with different steps. So we cannot uh, do the things fast, but it's something that we have to work on. Um, error of the final estimates, we don't have it. This is another project, it's a huge project, I would say, and actually it's something that we should solve in some way. We also try to do something in Italy for, with the previous research, but it's something that we still have to uh, deal with. Um, and this is also related to the question from David, uh, because actually, no, we didn't take into account the sample design yet, uh, but it's something that we should do, because actually we are assuming all missing at random uh, uh, missingness process, uh, and actually we know that uh, there is something that is going on that we should take into account, so at least the covariates linked to the um, sample uh, design. But the problem is that the two uh, data country provide different uh, uh, data for the labor force survey. So we don't have completely comparable data from the two countries for the labor force survey. So the only common covariate is um, age and proxy interview. That's why this was the only one that we used. And uh, yeah, we should also work on the structural part, of course. So, But this is a problem. We we are trying to ask for other data, but of course uh, this takes very long in order to make everything comparable. 7170 was an error, a mistake in the paper, and uh, the, the, the only thing uh, I think that we are missing, yeah, the longitudinal structure is taken into account because actually you can take into account uh, all the replies that the interview provides, uh, so there is a parameter that in the model that is taken into account this, the fact that the, some, um, there is a missingness uh, in the labor force survey process, so actually everything is uh, take, taken into account in the longitudinal structure of the waves. Um, and then uh, the difference between uh, the same error and uh, an error <laughs> is that actually we said uh, that uh, we believe that uh, the mistake you do, the error you commit uh, at uh, time point T depends on what you made uh, in the past. So we are assuming extra parameter if you made an error in T times one uh, and you can only repeat uh, the same error uh, in T. Otherwise, uh, if you committed an error, then we, we have some extra parameters to commit another kind of error. So, thanks. Um. Aurelian. <laughs> yes, so to answer to your question, uh, every year in, in Brazil we plan to, to assess to every indiv individual uh, his usual residence uh, uh, the first January of the year, but we don't plan to, to study the moving of individuals uh, in a year. But we will be, uh, we will enable to, um, to see the moving of people every year. Uh, so, to answer the question of the dual estimation, uh, for, so for now we've, we have applied the standard, the standard DSE method, so it's the basic one. Uh, it has been applied to small municipalities recorded in 2020, because in large municipalities uh, the census is not exhaustive, so making the application of the method is uh, more complicated. However, a, there is still um, too much of a coverage to draw conclusions from the, the results, and cu currently we are working to reduce the overcoverage. And if we are unable uh, to completely reduce the overcoverage, we will implement uh, the trimmed dual system estimation method, uh, and this model allow, uh, all allows the, allow us to have the presence of uh, overcoverage. 
And to answer your question, which was, um, yes, no, uh, in 2025, uh, Brazil uh, will become the sampling frame for the survey. So I think it's important for us to, to give uh, to users the probability of residence, and maybe they can use it to, to, to build the, the, the survey and, uh, and so on. Thank you. Uh, the last speaker, David. Um, so, one of the questions was on migration. So, uh, we are working to produce um, administrative record-based estimates for other years. And so, we are in that process looking at how people move from one place to another across time. Um, there are some challenges because some of the sources are um, more exact than others in, in terms of exactly when they're measuring um, a person's address. Um, but um, so that, that's something that we're having to deal with. In terms of accuracy of estimates, um, the larger report that this, that this paper is based on um, does a lot of comparison to um, other estimates out there uh, that the Census Bureau has produced um, to, to see if we can validate um, our methods. Um, so, so one example that the discussant gave was about uh, the person place uh, modeling uh, where we use the American Community Survey um, as our test bed for um, the probabilities that, that a person is in any particular place um, at a given time. Uh, and then we validate that using the 2020 census to see uh, how often um, those predictions are, are, um, are correct. So, so it's just a, a matter of, um, you know, it's great that we still have survey sources out there that where we can validate our methods. Thank you. Thank you. We are in time. The time we are in the time of, of closing. I thank you all the people attending this very interested session. The um, the people who organized. Uh, the advisory board, the <laughs> ISTAT people, and uh, I thank you all presenters and the research group that presented uh, here their very interesting results. Uh, uh, this, the afternoon session starts at 2. Okay, just a quick communication. Um, some of you had just uh, reserved for lunch at the restaurant in front of Istat, that is the Angolo di Napoli. You can just exit and cross the street and you will find it. And we have to be at 2 p.m. on time here to start again. Okay, thank you.